So I was going to briefly describe what an address is, although some of that's already been covered. Um, there's some things that I thought I wouldn't try and cover, or I'd just this would just take far too long. So I'll mention what I've excluded. A little bit about the legislation, and then three examples of actual addresses that were signed in Wellington, and then then happy to answer any questions. I think there's nothing like practical examples to try and understand the different issues. Uh, so partly that's already been covered by Brett. Um, I'll mention some things that I've excluded from the presentation, briefly mention legislation, and then explain three actual examples of how we've done it, and then hopefully some questions and answers. So the address is a unique way of identifying a property. The key thing is that by giving it a number or a combination of numbers and letters together with a street name, you should be able to uniquely identify a property. The most important thing for us here is to understand what do we mean by a property, and we regard what is separately occupied as the property. So we're not assigning addresses exclusively to lots or valuation references or anything else. Our primary aim is to understand what is separately occupied and then make sure that they can have an address. So if, if it's a rented property, a separate dwelling, could be a shop, anything like that, you should be able to allocate an address to it so it can be uniquely identified so emergency services can find it. And we think that's the primary reason for an address so that emergency services and visitors can find someone or find a property. They don't need to know where the internal property boundaries are or those sorts of things, but they do need to be able to tell how to find the property. I'll come back to this idea of separately occupied. I mentioned that um, exclusions, and um, we could speak at length about how we determine what the road name is going to be, but there's a lot of issues in that, so it's probably better if I concentrate on just the address and not the road name, but happy to answer questions or talk about it on another occasion. The other very important topic is life cycling. Um, for the purposes of this, I'm just talking about current addresses, but it's important that if someone says they want to know about 10 King Street, you need to be quite clear. Are they talking about the current 10 King Street or the proposed new one that's going to be there as soon as the subdivision is completed, or one of many different properties that have had that address in the past. And if you don't understand that idea of life cycle, you need to come up with the wrong answers. So it's important to understand that an address has a life cycle because it can relate to different things over time. Legislation, Trent mentioned that, so the, the Local Government Act. The thing that's different to us, to many councils, is that we have a bylaw that makes it mandatory that everyone must display the assigned address. The council allocated address must be displayed at your property. It's actually a criminal offence to not comply with the bylaw, so it's it's quite serious. We haven't had to prosecute anyone yet, but we have occasionally had to remind people that they aren't displaying the address. Usually that's in the cases where someone is um, it, there's confusion. People are having trouble finding things and we hear about it and we say, look, you need to be displaying your address. If they don't, we'll remind them that it must be done. The bylaw requires it. Um, so very helpful to have that backup, um, particularly when there's arguments between people about what address to show and we determine which one it should be and demand that they do display that address. The bylaw goes into sizes and all sorts of things, but that's this important. Now, the three examples, um, I thought I'd start with a relatively simple but common example. This is a single parcel of land, a single lot. There's one record of title for the whole area outlined in blue. It's all one rating unit, but there are three dwellings on it. So we have assigned three addresses, one to each of those dwellings, and um, because that's where the occupancy is. It relates to the dwellings. It doesn't relate to the, the parcel or the valuation or something else. That's, that's what it actually looks like. Um, fronting forward, there's two front doors to the two separate dwellings, and then there's another dwelling around the back. Um, one of the dwellings right on the corner has a back door that actually goes out to another street to the terrace. 
we could have assigned an alternative address to that if they needed one for the back door. But at the moment we haven't. But the idea of occupancy is our primary concern. The second example is um, a warehouse in Wellington, uh, Bunnings Warehouse. It's a large building. It's all open plan through the whole thing, one main entrance. And there's also a car park. We regard that whole complex as a single business. The public emergency services would all regard it as one thing. So we have assigned one address to that whole building, the whole property. If there was an, an entrance off another street, then that would have been given an alternative address, but there isn't in this particular case. But taking that one large property, this is what it's actually like in reality. We've said everything is all number 24 Kingsford Smith Street. Lynn's have got nine separate lots that are underlie the building. There are actually nine separate freehold records of title. One of the titles is actually owned by Bunnings and the other eight are all leased by Bunnings. Each, uh, there's actually three separate owners involved and no two adjoining properties are in the same ownership. Every adjoining property is in a different ownership to the others. So according to the valuation regulations, each lot needs to, and each record of title needs to be a separate rating unit. But we've still said it's people see it as one big property, so we've allocated 24. That means that all of the rating units are identified as 24. They all have the same address, but they each have their own legal descriptions. So you can distinguish between them by their legal descriptions or their title reference number. But the address, they all have the same address because it's all the same property, it's the same occupied area. The next example I want to provide is just one across the road from us here. It's 126 The Terrace. This building has 80 separate rating units, um, sub addresses, was mentioned just before. Um, there's 80 rating units on 13 floors. One ground floor unit has actually got two parts to it. Part of it is a shop and parts a dwelling, all used as one occupancy, but we've had to split it into two divisions for rating purposes so that the, the rates are calculated separately for the for the parts. And typically an individual unit in that complex would have an address like unit 9A at 126 the terrace or 9A slash 126 the terrace. The actual number 126 is not an assigned address. Um, all of the other addresses are the official addresses. 126 is a number that represents the whole complex. And if, if addresses were modelled the way we'd like to see it, there'd be cases where you should be able to say, this is a default that represents the whole block and then have all the sub addresses associated to it. Um, but there's no way that we know in the current models that that's allowed. In this particular case, you've also got Lynn showing all of the 80 addresses scattered all over the place. They, you know, they're not in any particular position, they're not readable. Um, we prefer to have addresses structured so that 126 shows and the other ones don't show, but, but you could get to that information because it was associated to the parent one. And I think the scope to improve the modelling, but yeah, it needs to be done consistently throughout the country. The idea of yeah, have one parent address, so the number 126 is displayed outside. You don't see outside all of the 80 individual parts, but just the 126. Um, and, and that helps identify where it is. Another thing that we think has got scope for improvement is the way when we do allocate addresses, they actually end up on the LINS maps. Um, we have had a few cases where LINS don't like the addresses we've allocated and choose not to show them. And that leads to all sorts of problems for the people that have bought the properties and trying to get networks tied up and everything else. It can, you know, sometimes this can take over a year before it's eventually resolved, and that's just unacceptable for the customers. Um, 
personally, I think if a council allocates an address and does it in a responsible way and, and follows the right standards, it should automatically be accepted. If Lynn's think we've made a mistake, we'd like to know about it and we'll talk about it, but not just choose not to show it um, because it isn't the way um, Lynn's would like to see it. And happy to answer any questions. Lynn. Yeah, Michael, thanks for that. I think um, just in the interests of time, um, we will skip questions on this segment, but if you do have any, um, feel free to pop them in the chat. We'll record them and get answers back to you after um, offline. Um, and maybe it sounds like there's a bit of scope for um, maybe a follow up with with the Lens addressing team. Um, you've raised some points there. <laughs> um, so and absolutely. My email address is on the presentation too. I'm happy to, if anyone wants to contact me later. Cool, okay. No, thanks for that, Mike. Um, you've made some really interesting points there um, and some interesting examples. That Bunning one, Bunnings one was a bit special. Um, um, yeah. And I think in that case, it was all in two ownerships, everything except one piece in one ownership. But relatively recently, the owner decided to sell off every second one to a different associated company, probably for tax or finance reasons or something. But the rules say they then become separate rating units. Uh, cool. Okay. Well, thanks again, Michael. Um, I will now queue up uh, Ati from NZ Post. So, Off you go. Um, my name's Ati. I'm from New Zealand Post. Um, I'll just quickly go through this very quickly. Um, so, I'm just going to introduce who we are, what we do, um, the sources of addressing data that uh, we um, get from, um, the format of the addressing data, and the uses of the addressing data. Okay, so quickly, who we are. Um, so we address data services group. Um, and it comprises of the addressing support team, which are basically our data entry people. There's only two of them. The addressing specialists, which I'm a part of. And we've got the location services data specialist who is in charge of um, integration of addressing data in the back end. And he handles all of our technical issues. Um, that's Thomas. Um, I hope Thomas is, I'm pretty sure Thomas is here. Okay, let's go. Um, so what we do, uh, we maintain, validate, analyze, and cleanse addressing data uh, for mail sort, sortation and, and two properties. Uh, we also create address data products uh, tailor-made for uh, to suit individual needs for external clients, such as the PATH, the GeoPath, and I'll go through that uh, at a later stage. Okay, so the addressing sources. Primarily, we um, rely on the urban and rural network delivery branches. Um, so they usually say there's a new house um, on their round. So they send through updates to, through to the address support team who enter it in, into our MPAD system. And from there, it gets um, migrated to each of our different systems within our network. Um, have requests from our career post fleet and our service delivery managers um, on behalf of their customers. So their customers will probably come to them and say, hey, where's my address? It's missing. So we go back into um, our systems and we investigate and um, we query LINs and also the council. And if it's postal valid, we, we add it. Um, and if not, we escalate it further to LINs just to all councils just to find out what the correct valid address is. We also get um, requests from our customer call centre um, from the external public, like Joe Bloggs will come in and say, hey, where's my address? Can you please activate this? And that's how we also get through um, addresses. So these three points, these are known as postal addresses. So postal addresses means that our network delivery deliver to those property addresses. We also get um, the address data sources from Land and Information um, New Zealand, LINs. Um, so these are physical addresses. Um, quite often they're new addresses that have come through. So we usually, they usually come through um, by way of um, a, a, a data feed uh, every two weeks. Um, in which um, Thomas, who's our locational services a specialist, will um, integrate them into our systems, and they will remain there as physical addresses. Um, 
We also get addresses from territorial authorities, physical addresses again, potentially new addresses uh, in the system, and also government agencies. Like um, we also manage the Ministry of Health ESAM uh, database, which they come through um, and ask um, on behalf of the DHBs whereabouts uh, the patient addresses that are not currently in the system, and we will validate and create. Um, and we will also um, communicate with LINs and councils. Um, so these three points are called physical addresses. Physical addresses are addresses that we do not deliver to, but are potentially new addresses coming through. Um, we also get requests from mail house customers. Um, so quite often um, a big mail house customer will say, oh, we've, we've done a big mail campaign, um, but we've got all these return um, RTS letters. We want to know why, so we will escalate and find out if these addresses are valid, enter them into the system, or just query them, escalate them if um, they're not. And also, we've got a, um, a tool called Suggest Address where the um, general public can go online and, and say to us, oh, this is an address that's missing. Can you please add it for us? It comes through to um, us and we also um, communicate with uh, LINs and Council and just to see if these are valid addresses. And uh, those two points, they're all postal addresses, so um, they'll be potentially activated into our system for mail delivery and courier delivery. So the format of the, uh, the address, uh, so we adhere to the Australian and NZ address standards guidelines published by LINs. Um, so it's either an address line format. So I'm just going to. Can you see that? Yes. Yep. So yep. address line formats, um, the addresses appear in address lines. So for example, 33 Conclusion Street is address line one. It's got Park address line two, which is the suburb. And then you've got your town, city, and the postcode address line three. Okay. And also, uh, the address um, the format also appears in addressing elements parsed out for our um, address um, products. Can you see that? So they're in separate yes. lines. Yeah. And all the address elements have been parsed out for customers. Um, we send this is called the PAF file, and we send it through every quarter um, for customers to cleanse their database um, according to what is active within that quarter. So all of these PAF addresses are active according to our network delivery. Okay, sorry guys. Um, the address types, um, we've got an urban address. Um, so urban addresses are, again, um, addresses that are located in um, high densely populated areas, um, towns and cities, such as this uh, like example. But we've also got um, the rural address. I'll just uh, type in an example. Our rural addresses um, generally they're located out in remote areas, and um, they actually have a an RD number here. This RD number um, denotes the round of the rural driver, and it's also accompanied by a mail town instead of um, town city. So sometimes the town city and mail town are the same. Others other times they're different, and it's because uh, a mail town is basically a hub of where each of the rural um, mail is sorted up from and delivered to the rural drivers who will then go through the, the roads and deliver it to the rural properties. Um, and if you've noticed, uh, there are two different versions of the rural address. So we get a lot of this all the time. A lot of people say, why have two, um, two versions of a rural address? And that's because one of them, the physical address, 
is the actual valid address from Council and Lynn's, whereas this one, it's a postal address and it has our postal um, data to deliver rural delivery mail items. So that's why we have two different versions of the same rural address. But if you notice, if we click on the physical address, it will go to um, this needs a rural delivery number and the correct post addresses got the ID number. Um, so postcodes uh, actually determine whether or not uh, an address is rural or urban. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing because it's quite complex, but um, essentially the third digit of a postcode, if it's 0123, it's in an urban zone. Um, if it's a rural address or rural postcode, if the third digit is a seven, eight or nine, it's rural. Um, and this is um, to help out with the sortation machines. Um, it's it's embedded into all the sort plans. Um, and this is why this is. And I've gone through the categories of address, like physical address and postal address. And finally, um, the uses of uh, the address addressing data. Um, again, we um, it populates um, run management systems for our network delivery teams to maintain for mail sort delivery and also courier. Um, it assists with the automation machines, such as uh, for mail courier items. Um, it populates various uh, address APIs for our internal and online platforms, such as eShip or UShop or redirections. It also helps out with billing. Um, it publish uh, addresses uh, information on to the APF for validation of postal and physical addresses, which is what you've just seen, um, the address postcode finder. Um, it's also used to create the the um, addressing products, such as the PATH, the GeoPath, uh, which is an enhancement of the postal address file. The PNF, which is um, it's a postal network file. Um, it's to do with postcodes uh, and polygons. NZ is another popular um, NZ Post product. And we also offer addressing cleansing services um, according to um, our postal delivery. So if a customer wants to send through their database and say, oh, can you please cleanse this with all postal delivery? That's what we'll do um, at a cost. And of course, um, address validation services such as Realme and Ministry of Health, they also use our data for um, address validation. Um, and um, as um, Trent brought up before, there are challenges. Um, there are delays and um, we are work working through them, but um, yeah, it is quite difficult at times because sometimes uh, the delivery branches forget to you know, send us the, the update information or delivery branches say one, one version of the address, Council has another vision of, of address and Linz have another vision altogether. So there's a lot of confusion, but we are working through it at the moment. So that's about it. Sorry, guys, any questions? Thanks, Ati. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. I just need to scroll back up. Uh, yep. Kim, Olivia, I cannot see the need for the rural format since we already have rapid numbers, road names and localities. Would you have a... Yeah, and Kim's well, actually got his hand up. Did you want to say something on top of that, Kim? Uh, yes, because the postcode is unique for each rural delivery, so uh, we know which rural delivery it is. So in the town, we don't say what our delivery route is for our letters. So I don't see why we have to do that anymore with rural ones, because you're not allowed to use the town, the farm name anymore for privacy reasons. So mm -hmm. you've got to have a, a rapid number anyway. So we could yeah. standardise the whole New Zealand address system by eliminating rural addresses, and you could still use it just the same. You don't have to have post town uh, towns which confuse everybody. You've got the locality of where the address is, and yep. you've got the postcode which uh, defines the rural delivery route. I agree. I agree. But that takes time and money to actually change our data set like that. And um, yeah, it, 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 it's a big change, big change. But we are looking at it at the moment. But it is a big change if we were to go through that route, which I'm pretty sure we will. 
Um, but yeah, yeah. I, I do understand. I do understand. Yeah, I, I can see it's a policy change, but it's yeah. well overdue. Yes, yes, agreed, agreed. Thanks, Kim. Um, and Mark uh, Coburn has just uh, got a question here, and this is one I've heard a situation about recently as well. How do NZ Post update an area from rural to urban? We have a subdivision that will have up to 400 new houses over a stage development, but this is currently a rural delivery area. Council rezoned the land to general residential about 20 years ago, so just wanted to know what the process is to change from rural delivery to urban delivery. And in the case I heard about recently up in uh, north of Auckland, um, the developer found that there wouldn't be mail delivery to the um, individual properties that they were uh, quite late in the stage going to have to put a like a add a PO box hut at the main at the main road um, for like all that large subdivision. Yeah, um, because they, they couldn't get mail delivery to the door of all the new the houses in the subdivision. So yeah, that's an interesting question there from Mark. Yep, very interesting. Um, so um, what determines rural and urban zones or delivery? Um, it's the rural network delivery and the SDMs with the, within the urban area who service that area and they determine whether or not an address is rural or an, an area is, is rural. Um, I think it, it does depend on whether or not there is um, it's a health and safety issue. So if a postie cannot actually walk and deliver to an address with no footpath and there's like a speed limit, apparently I think that is classed as or deemed as rural. Um, but yeah, it's they're the ones that come up with the the actual zoning of the rural and and, and urban zones. Uh, we only do what they tell us to do. Um, okay, and we will. I think uh, there is a couple more questions, but we'll just wrap that up there for um, for NZ Post today. Thanks, Ati, again for your yep. presentation. Um, right. And I'll we'll get back to those questions later on but uh in the interest of time and it's going to be super quick sam sorry uh time has crunched up but uh, i'll pass you over to sam uh from kind order sure ben thank you for that no worries i figured i might have a uh, reduced time so we'll go for something short and sweet um kia ora everybody uh call sam keys toku inua work for kind of order uh and i'm here to talk to you about what happens when we get the addresses wrong. So you've heard a little bit before about kind of what happened behind the scenes when we're actually trying to define addresses. And I'm gonna kind of talk to you a bit more from a customer perspective of that. So uh, I'll cover the types of issues we see, the impact they have on people, and then I'll talk about some potential solutions, um, but that's very much open for discussion. There are smarter people in the room. <laughs> uh, so one of the types of issues we see is uh, where we have a address point and the same property has a different physical address versus the postal address, typically the different number. Uh, and the same issue also occurs when we get a difference between what the council have put in as the address versus what Linz have put in the address. It's been covered a little bit already. Um, and here's just an example of that. Um, all of these addresses are completely fictional, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, we get one type of issue where the incorrect road suffix is recorded in our system. It's more of like a data entry type issue. But for example, we've got Green Street recorded in our system, but it may actually be Green Boulevard in the official uh, addressing database. Mm -hmm. um, We've got another issue where the corner addresses can sometimes have different uh, both numbers and street names, but they're still referring to the same property. Um, so for example, we've got 41 Sam Street, and we've also got a one million column road. They're both talking about the same property. We've got one more, which is perhaps a, one more unique to newer developments um, where when kind of order our building new houses, we'll often kind of assign random, not random, but uh, unofficial addresses to particular locations. And then when they are formally built, the council is assigning different address names to those particular buildings, but our system is still out of sync and we haven't updated that. 
so you end up with something where it looks like they've just start with and then officially becomes that and everything's sort of out of sync. Uh, a similar situation we encounter is where a particular address point isn't formally recorded. So you've got multiple dwellings sitting on one particular address, but the back property isn't a formal uh, address. It's sort of parked under the bigger uh, property. We tend to see that in like, uh, to say, Marais and Northland, where they've got housing on the same address, but there's only one address point for that location. And lastly, as far as issues go, is multiple addresses or groups in especially with one point. And this is a pain in the butt to try and work out where, like how many points are there on that particular property, what being represented by that one property. This very quick will run through what the types of issues we see are. But the key thing I want to impress on people is that it's not just a data problem. All of these types of issues have real impact on people's livelihoods. Um, so, for example, tenancy agreements. Um, if we're referring to an address that's no longer like a legal point, then all of that kind of goes out the window. Um, kind of order putting up post boxes on these sites that we build. Um, if we're putting in the wrong uh number of the address on the post box and all of a sudden the postal address then becomes an issue and people aren't receiving the mail intended for them uh, the electoral commission if their if what people think is their address is not recorded in the electoral commission then they can't receive voting papers and that impacts their ability to vote um, mail being delivered to the wrong address is a common thing anyway but uh, that's a, a reflection of those types of issues. And then we've got maintenance for utilities, waters. Uh, if we are sending people over to fix a, a lighting fixture in someone's house, we want those contracts to turn up to the right property. Um, conversely, if we're sending someone to demolish a house, we definitely want to send them to the right property. <laughs> um, and as already covered, emergency services, if we're sending people to an address, we want them to be going to the right address. Um, and some of these, I think, are reflective of uh, both kind of order data entry issues and then a sort of disconnect between uh, postal addressing and physical addressing. And we communicate to our tenants with a particular address format, but that's inconsistent. Mm. So we're not mm. consistently talking to people about their physical address. So they sign a piece of paper saying they live on 41 Sum Street, and then all of the blow on bits of, well, I've been told 41 Sum Street is my address. Why can't I find it in my electoral commission? I'm sending more, like all of my mail to this address. Why isn't it being delivered? So it's all coming off that. Mm. Um, as far as existing solutions go, when we uncover these types of issues, we generally notify uh, Torchy Defenua, um, the addressing team, so Trent and his team, uh, and we're just trying to uncover what is the correct address for that location. Uh, and that's the mix of going, I assume you guys go through and walk council to figure out what's happening there, but we get a very uh, clear response back and we adjust our system to fix that. But some of the potential solutions that we could do is to only use one particular address format when we are talking with staff and tenants and generically the entire public so that we're all talking the same language to people who are not experts in addressing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a a question on my side about if there is a need for physical and postal addresses to be different now. They're still talking about the same location, so I don't know if that's a valid thing now. Um, and then, yeah, is there a better way that we can think about addressing? Uh, I hear Kimo and Nathan talk about postcodes and the wonders of the UK addressing system. Maybe that's something that New Zealand should be looking at too. Mm. Um, that's 
all I have for you. That's my slides. So I'm just leaving some ideas on things that we could do to change our addressing. Mm -hmm. If you liked any of that, you can flick me a message. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's back to you, Ben. Mm -hmm. Also happy to take questions, but it is past time. And I, I yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. There are still a good number of people on the line, um, a couple of Dr. Wader next meetings, but um, if you are happy to stay on a bit and have got a question, feel free to fire it through. Um, I haven't seen any come through in the chat specifically for you yet, Sam. Um, Work for me. But you've raised some in question, interesting questions yourself that, are, again, they're reflected conversations we've already had. Um, Peter Inward, a recent development of 13 units has a single physical access, i.e. 64 Waverley Street. Six of the letterboxes have been installed along Gladstone Road, which doesn't seem logical. Yeah, it doesn't seem logical. You're right. No. Yeah. Uh, if I recall correctly, Peter's located in Nelson or Tasman. What we're doing for addressing in theory should be following what councils do mm -hmm. and then coming off from that. But again, we're building developments, we're assigning them mm -hmm. uh, in theory the names that they will be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that process doesn't work mm -hmm. as expected. I don't know precisely what's happening with the letterboxes, though. That's pretty. Uh, mm -hmm pretty absurd. That's an interesting one. Uh, Kim would like to see private roads identified. These are road names on right of ways that have been made to add addresses. I don't know if that's directed specifically at Kang Order, just a general wish. Just a general wish list, but yeah. <laughs> uh, Peter's followed up. We allocated the address points at each unit and the letterboxes have been installed after this. Maybe they're just in the wrong place. A weird one, for sure. Uh, I have a look at it now, just to see what's happening. But yeah, it's pretty, like I said, absurd. Yeah, assuming it is, it's a KO development. That's why Peter's bringing it up. <laughs> cool. Well, I think we'll wrap it up there, everyone. Five minutes after the hour. Um, thank you very much for um, dialing in. I will just close with our closing karakia. Uh, kua ete kopapa. Kare na hua, kare na arawai, ko ma te matauranga, he arahina na mahi a totu te fenua, kia to te marie, ki runga i a tato katoa, homie hui e tai ki e. Our work has come to a satisfactory conclusion. The fruit is growing, the waterways continue to flow. We now have the knowledge to lead and drive the work of Toitu Te Whenua. May peace settle upon all of us, uh, gather and go forward together. Thank you, everyone.